Now, questions from the committee. Senator LaFaver. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, um, Superintendent Luna. Um, just to begin with, um, I, I'm, I'm a little confounded by um, the way your, your budget numbers are looking. And, and, and I guess um, I'm trying to understand how, um, how you're arguing that if we um, do not make these changes, we will somehow um, restore programs when, from what I can tell, you're continuing the cuts that we talked about earlier. Um, are, are, does your plan um, include restoration of that $128 million that we, we cut last year, restoration of the um, textbooks, the gifted and talented programs, the safe and drug-free schools, the transportation, the reading and math initiative? Does your plan include restoration of all those? Superintendent. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator LaFaver, the answer to most of what you said is yes, but it does not do it by raising taxes. What it does is we look at the amount of money we currently have and we agree to spend some of it differently. By increasing our class sizes by one to two students over the next five years, that frees up about $500 million over the next five years because we have about 800 fewer teachers. You take that money that is saved, and that's how you make up for the shortfalls we have. That's how you bring, the, that's how you provide the money to restore the salary grid. That's how you provide the money to increase teacher pay. That's how you provide the money to restore the money that's been cut from technology and, and other areas. So what we're talking about is not growing the pie, but just spending it, cutting the pie up differently. Mr. Chairman, follow up? Follow up. Um, I guess I guess I kind of fail to see how that's possible. Um, but but what I'll ask just more specifically along those lines is, you you have put on this pie chart a huge amount of blue for what you said is restoring um, the uh, salary increases and our educator salary increases. And I want to make sure I'm clear: what of that would is actual salary increases that we do now versus what you would do under your proposal and how you're able to accomplish that and still restore basically the 128 million that we don't have for all those other other functions of the schools superintendent mr chairman senator lefavor i'll give it one more shot we are going to take the money that we already have and spend it differently so by having seven or 800 fewer teachers two years from now, then we don't have the expense of those seven or 800 teachers two years from now. That's money that's currently being spent today on those teachers. We take that money then and we redirect it to restore funding in other areas that have been cut. So it's, it's, it's no different than if we were sitting around trying to figure out a family budget and we only have X number of dollars, and here's what we need to accomplish. We're going to divide that money up based on what our priorities are. So uh, that's that's so uh, I, we're not increasing the funding for education with this program. We're taking what we currently have and spending it differently. Mr. Chairman, one more. <clears throat> I am on the budget committee, so. Um, I guess I just I fail to see how this pencils out when you're adding in laptops and adding in paying for the long uh, online courses. Um, I, I simply can't imagine unless you're making teachers work, you know, like even more than the already like 12-hour days many of them do. I just I don't understand how you anticipate that fewer 800 fewer teachers can accomplish all of this on top of um, what they're already doing. Superintendent. Mr. Chairman and Rep or Senator LaFaver, uh, um, this next year we increase classroom divisors by 1.25. Uh, that means that we will have fewer teachers and so we will spend $68 million less on salaries and benefits next year. Then the following year we increase the divisors by another 0.75, which means that we increase class sizes a bit more. Uh, which means we will need fewer teachers. That saves us about another $40 million. So 
we, are, we have $108 million a year then to redirect into other areas of education. We spend it on technology, we spend it on raising teacher pay, we spend it on pay for performance, uh, we spend it on restoring the $20 million that has been cut from the, uh, from the facilities uh, uh, maintenance. Uh, we use it for professional development. It's, uh, it's uh, I, I don't know how easier to explain the concept that we no longer live in a world where we can expect more and more money every year for education. Uh, and that's the current system we have today, and I think maybe that's what you struggle with because traditionally we expect tens of millions of more dollars every year just for education just to continue to do what we've done in the past. If we want to do anything over and above, then we have to get new money. Nobody has considered taking the $1.25 billion we have and spending it differently, and that's what this plan does. Mr. Chairman, Senator, we'll come back to you. But can I just explain what my problem is? I, the, the thing is that many of these programs we eliminated, we eliminated teachers because we didn't have enough, we, we, so that we weren't doing those anymore. So I don't see where those teachers are being restored. In fact, the number is being reduced. So it's just not penciling out for me. So. Your comment's taken. Senator Andresen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Superintendent Luna, I missed something somewhere. If we... If we, I, I represent the two largest school districts in the state, Boise and Meridian. Let's say, for mathematical purposes, that I lose uh, 100 teachers in Boise School District and 10 in, in Nampa School District. How does, that, how does that follow through with having the money for each school district as a result of not as many teachers? Superintendent. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Andresen, I'm, I'm not following your question. If, 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 the, if there are 100 fewer teachers in a school district, then that, teacher, then that school district's expenses go down by whatever they were paying those 100 teachers. And then that money goes to stabilize the current financial situation we find ourselves in and then also used to put technology into classrooms, uh, increase teacher pay, and, and those uh, areas. It would, I don't know if that was your question, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, uh, go ahead. What I'm saying is we're not going to lose teachers at the same level in each school district. In some school districts, well, let's say we use, like Boise, we'll lose... Uh, 100 teachers, and Nampa, I mean, uh, Meridian will use, lose 10 teachers. How does that level out in terms of the money for each of those school districts? Superintendent. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Andresen, school districts will le lose teachers based on their size. And so Meridian, being the largest school district, will lose more teachers than a Nampa or a Boise and then as you get down to the smallest school districts, they lose in single digits, if any. We have some school districts that will not lose any teaching positions because of the way they're funded. So just as we fund our schools based on the number of students you have qualifies you for X number of teachers. And what we're saying is that for the number of students you have, you will qualify for a slightly fewer number of teachers. But it will be equitable. If, uh, if, if the Meridian School District is 10 times larger, than uh, a smaller district, then they will see 10 times more or fewer teachers than the, than, than the smaller district. Mr. Chairman. Senator Dresden. On another matter, you mentioned a few minutes ago that they would start out with laptop computers, but that later it may change to a different device. As a result of that changing to a different device, how do we replace the laptops with a new device, uh, will we have the money to do that? Superintendent. Mr. Chairman and Senator Andresen, um, the answer is yes. In the bill that we put forward, first off, it, um, it begins 18 months from now. That's when the first laptop or whatever the technology is, is deployed. It's deployed with the ninth graders who are currently seventh graders today. 
18 months from now, they'll be starting their ninth grade year of high school. That will be the first class that will receive these mobile devices. And then each subsequent year for the next four years, uh, we add one more class until five years from now, every student in high school will have a mobile computing device. Then every year after that, we replace another grade. And so it's a four-year rollover. Uh, so when a student receives that device, their ninth grade year, they'll have that device until they graduate from high school. And the next ninth grade class coming in gets a brand new device. And every year, the ninth graders start with a new device. And they, it's, it's expected to last them for four years. And, and, the, and the funding is there to not only replace them, uh, but to uh, provide all of the repair, all of the technical support, and all of the maintenance. Superintendent, before I forget, so can you provide us with a digital copy of this pie graph? Yes. Senator Taransky, did you have a question? I did, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Superintendent Luna, as you mentioned, the hot button issues thus far have been class size, laptops, and online classes. Uh, there's been a complaint uh, about process, and that's what I want to ask you about. And the complaint is that there are a lot of groups that are concerned about the education of our children. There are associations, there are teachers, administrators, uh, and there are parents. And there has been no buy-in for your plan. Uh, the plan was developed in isolation. It was introduced last month. And uh, what I'm hearing is, why don't we uh, take a deep breath, a step back, and more deliberatively uh, consider our options? Uh, what would be your response? Superintendent. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Senator Toransky, uh, I appreciate that because I, I, you know, we've all heard much of the same. Uh, let me tell you what the, uh, the um, collaboration that has taken place that you find in this bill. Uh, one of the biggest parts of this bill, especially financially, are the, is the pay-for-performance plan. Uh, that was agreed to uh, through an 18-month 18 18, 18 process where you had all parties at the table, uh, from school boards to PTA to the business community to the teachers' association uh, to superintendents. Um, so uh, the, the buy-in for that portion of the plan is there. Uh, we all, all of the groups that you mentioned and more, were, are part of the Education Alliance of Idaho that is a product of efforts by the IBCEE to, uh, to develop a transformational agenda for education in Idaho. And that, again, was an 18-month to two-month, 18-month to two-year process of identifying four specific areas that we wanted to see education focus on in order to improve. Uh, again, uh, uh, and, and I will mention the Albertsons Foundation that played a big role in the alliance and still does. Again, um, y y you look at the Education Alliance and the goals and objectives that everybody agreed to in that alliance and you find them in this plan. Um, you won't find uh, uh, agreement on removing, uh, eliminating tenure. You won't find agreement on removing evergreen clauses in master agreements. You won't find agreement on um, uh, the seniority, uh, removing seniority as a portion of a reduction in force. Um, and uh, I, I don't know, knowing the process we went to, through just to come up with a pay for performance plan, knowing the process and the obstacles we went through to, to uh, come up with the alliance plan, uh, those are the kinds of things that, through leadership, have to happen. They're, they're not going to happen through consensus because just the nature of labor and management relationships. I will tell you that when you look at the labor bill, mo much of that we developed working closely with the school board's association. Uh, and, uh, and, and so much of what you find in that bill is, is, is working closely with them. And I think that you'll find that, they have very, that they're very supportive of it. And also, uh, Senator, I think you'll find that most of these associations, whether it's the superintendents or, or school boards, are going to stand up and tell you that there are parts of this that they like 
and there are parts of it they don't like. Most of it's the medicine. I mean, it's, it's, everybody's the exception to the rule. They like this, they like that, but in their district this wouldn't work well, or, you know, how are we going to, you know, get by with fewer teachers? I understand the dynamics of that, but the fact is we have few options, and one of those options is going to be implemented, and one of those options is inaction, and we don't have the time to, uh, to, uh, to sit around the table for another 18 months to two years to try to resolve these issues, that would be in action, and we don't, we, we don't have the luxury of that with the current economic crisis that we face. Senator Transky. Mr. Chairman, Superintendent Luna, uh, besides laptops and class size, uh, the other thing uh, that I've been hearing about is local control. Uh, the principle that the government closest to the people governs best, uh, that many of the people who complain about directives coming uh, from the federal government uh, now favor directives coming from the state. Uh, how would you respond to a criticism that your plan is a series of one-size-fits-all one directives and uh, consequently takes local control uh, away from the districts. Superintendent. Thank you, Senator uh, Toriansky and Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I, I don't think that you'll find that in this law. I, I think it's uh, definitely um, um, uh, does get people's attention, including mine as a former school board member, anytime somebody uh, brings up the concern of eroding local control. I can tell you that as a school board member, how frustrated I was with how little control I had because of evergreen clauses that were found in our master agreement because of tenure that uh, made it difficult for us, if, if not impossible, for us to deal with uh, poor uh, performance. How frustrating it was to not have the ability to uh, reward excellence uh, in the classroom uh, be because of the adherence to the salary grid and because of things that were found in our master agreement that were put in that master agreement by school boards and, and, uh, and, and union officials uh, 10, 15 years before I ever became a school board member. Because we're removing those restrictions, local school boards are now going to have more say in how their districts uh, ha have operated than ever before. Uh, when it comes to the financial side of this, uh, the, the state has always set graduation requirements. Uh, the state has always directed money to districts for transportation, for salary and benefits, for technology, uh, for gifted and talented, for safe and drug-free schools. Uh, this, this follows a, a similar pattern, but I think provides even more flexibility once that line item money gets to the district. Districts are going to decide the best policy for how to implement their uh, the laptop or mobile computing device uh, program. Districts are going to decide the online courses that students will take. Uh, just as we require students to take three years of math and three years of science, we leave it up to the district to decide how to manage that. We'll give districts the flexibility to manage these uh, the, 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 the the um, specifics of the students come first uh, program. So as a former school board member, uh, I, I can tell you that this, that this bill in its total gives districts and school board members specifically far more control over the, their districts than they've had in the past. Superintendent, you might address the, uh, <clears throat> the issue of state purchasing of, of the devices and the, the purchasing of the, uh, the, the maintenance agreement. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, there, there are two areas in Students Come First that deal with technology. The one deals with the classroom technology. That's the roughly $6,000 per class. 20% um, uh, of that is going to be professional development, and, uh, and, and that will look different district to district depending on what the needs of the local district and classrooms are. Um, when, it, when it comes to the hardware, uh, districts are going to be given the same flexibility that they're given today when the state provides them funding for technology. Uh, there will be a, a, a long list of different devices that they can choose from based on what the needs are in their schools. For example, uh, in some of the Treasure Valley schools here, there's, uh, th there's technology in those classrooms that you wouldn't find in almost any uh, other schools around the state. 
so obviously the, the needs here for technology would be different than the needs in other uh, districts. And so we give the districts the flexibility on uh, the kind of technology that they need for their classrooms. And we'll use the same procedures that we use today when we distribute monies to our districts for technology. When it comes to the laptops or the mobile computing devices, uh, over the next 18 months, uh, we will work with a committee as called for by this piece of legislation. This legislation requires that the state superintendent form a committee to deal, to develop a plan for the purchase, the implementation, the, the support, and the, uh, um, the workings of this uh, uh, project. And understand that it's 18 months before we deploy the first laptop. It's 18 months before any student is required to take any online courses. We specifically put that language in there uh, of, the, of the committee and also the timeline to make sure we have plenty of input, plenty of buy-in before we roll the program out. And in, in one final note, Mr. Chairman, is that I will be required to come to you about a year from now and describe what that program is before the legislature then votes to uh, uh, allow that funding to move forward. Thank you. Senator Malapai. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Superintendent Luna, thank you for giving us an overview of what your perspective is on the landscape as it surrounds uh, education. Um, I don't have time right now to ask a lot of questions, a lot of questions about stuff that you said, um, you know, from class sizes, no studies to show that uh, large class sizes would diminish the quality of the delivery of education. Uh, I've heard a lot about uh, union bosses or unions. Uh, I'm, I'm a little concerned that, uh, that when you mention unions, there is a whole lot of teachers out there that are teaching AP biology, AP calculus that what you call union members and there are a whole lot of teachers of the year for decades that are what we call union members and I and I'm concerned that on the one hand you say the teachers is a major component of student success at the same time you paint this picture that that this uh, this, this union person is a, is a monster that uh, is causing <laughs> putting up barriers and walls to student success. I, I guess um, I, my question is going to be along the lines of Senator Toyansky. Any major reform like the one we're looking at today requires a lot of time. Now you mentioned 18 months, a lot of time. You have a task force, you might have a commission, you have all the stakeholders in. No matter what time you need, you've got to get it right the first time. The first time. Because if it isn't right the first time, then we're really experimenting with what we could be doing the next four years. And if it doesn't work, then we're in experimental states with the other 49 states. And then we have to come back again. It's going to cost us millions to, again, reform that system. So my, my question, uh, Superintendent Luna, Those that are on the front lines are the ones that actually know how to implement. They understand the climate under which those kids are operating in the schools. Uh, they know the equipment that they have. They have an idea, a really good idea, of how to improve education. And we can talk about resources, lack of resources, or whatever, but they know. Now, the collaboration that I'm hearing, I, I agree with. I think the collaboration was on the goals. But I don't think there was a lot of collaboration on the implementation part of reaching that goal. So, Superintendent, is, is teacher matter? I mean, do those individuals on the front line, does it matter in anything that we're talking about in regards to this proposal? Because in any private and public institution to do a major reform like this, you need the stakeholders to buy in, or it is not a success. So, where's, uh, is there any, are the teachers not? a part of this, uh, or any educator for that matter, do they not have any role in this? It's just we just say, do as, as I tell you, and just do it. Is that, is that how we're doing this, <laughs> Superintendent? Superintendent. Mr. Chairman, Senator Malapai, uh, 
I think it's obvious that that is not the intent, and that's, that's not what's happened here. I, I want to go back and read you the specific language that I used because it was intentional. I refer to teachers union representatives, and I refer to leaders of the teachers union. I never refer to teachers themselves. It is my opinion, and it's only my opinion, that the teachers union leaders do not represent most teachers in Idaho. And, 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 and I believe they do not represent most of their own members in their goals and their objectives. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and I think they're completely out of touch with the electorate and with parents uh, as to what parents, <clears throat> who I believe are actually the ones who know what's best for their child. Uh, I think, they're, I think the, the teachers union leaders are out of touch and what I tried to display for you is their attempt to rile people up. That was their own goal. They stated it in their own email. Their attempt to rile people up over laptops and over online classes and class sizes because by their own admission, you can't get people riled up over contract issues. So my, my issue is not with teachers. In fact, I think that's why you see this plan focuses more on teachers than it does any other part. The technology going into the classroom is to give the teachers the tools they need. The, uh, the, the biggest portion of the additional funding we're going to spend uh, of, of the savings is going to increase teacher pay. There's, uh, there's historic amounts of professional development for teachers that we've never seen in a state budget before. And the reason is because we know that the teacher is the most important factor in a child's academic success. So teachers play a critical role uh, what I have an issue with is the tactics and the message of union leaders, not members of the union and definitely not teachers. Senator Malpair, are you contemplating another question there? Well, I, I, <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. It did stimulate a question or two, but <laughs> I, I'm just going to ask one more, and I'm going to, we're going to yield back to, to you, Mr. Chairman. You know, the, the Superintendent, uh, there seems to be um, a lack of understanding what tenure. Um, it just seems to me that when you say, when people say tenure, that you can never get rid of a bad teacher. Uh, would you agree that tenure is a, is a term that applies primarily at the university level, and the tenure that we're really talking about here is that you can, there's no such thing as a job forever in, in, in K-12. Would you agree with that? And, and if so, does that mean then that um, the tenure that we're talking about, you can, you can relieve someone if he's not a good teacher. That tenure, the term that we're using it, it's not a forever thing that you can never get rid of anybody. Is that, are we, are we on the same, on the same uh, level or the same understanding, uh, Superintendent? Superintendent. Uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Malapai, I, um, I definitely agree with you that there's some semantics there. But uh, uh, there's no doubt in my mind as a former school board member that continuing contract status, which many people refer to as, as tenure, makes it, uh, I, I won't say impossible because nothing's impossible, but uh, it's about as close to impossible as you can get when, to, to uh, remove a teacher for poor performance especially if you feel the need to do it quickly. Now, there are processes. They may take you 18 months to two years. Meanwhile, the teacher stays in the classroom or they're relieved of classroom responsibilities and you still pay them. There are processes. If it's very detailed, it's very cumbersome. If you, if you make one stumble, you start all the way over or you, or you submit yourself to a lawsuit that will cost, cost you $100,000 to resolve. So what I have found in my experience is that what happens is that there's an, a settlement made and there's an agreement to buy out a teacher's contract for whatever's left, an agreement that you put nothing in their file that gives any future employer the indication of poor performance in the classroom and then the teacher moves on and teaches somewhere else. Uh, those, those have to change. We have to assure that every child has a great teacher every year. Uh, so it, it, it's semantics, I believe, I, when, when, whether it's tenure or continuing contract, I think that you end up with the same results, and that is a, a system today that is not only difficult to reward great teachers, but difficult to deal properly with poor teaching. 
Mr. Chairman, indulge me just for one comment. Follow up. Mr. Chairman, uh, Superintendent, it is pretty obvious to me that we really do need to educate each other on the, on the scenarios that we're talking about because we don't want any misperceptions to go out to the general public uh, and, and we need to tell the actual truth of what everything is all about. And, and I, what I'm hearing is there's so many misperceptions about how we look at tenure and those kinds of things. We need to, we, Mr. Chairman, we really do need to educate each other on, on the true meaning of what that tenure is and what actually does happen in the, in the school system. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Thank you, Superintendent. Thank you.